Hey guys, Jim here. Welcome back once again. Long time no see. I haven't had a lot of time to come out here and make videos, but what I've been trying to do is make sure that each video that I do is worth my time out of the shop to sit in here and, you know, do the videos and, and do all the work and editing and, and, and uploading and all that stuff, and that it's worthwhile for you to take the time to sit down and watch. So I try to bring out something unique, something interesting, and uh, working harder to bring out makers that have availability. You know, for years and years and years, I brought out a lot of makers that, you know, either had three, four, five years of a wait list or their books were closed. And I realize it's frustrating, but I was sharing with you a lot of knives that were in my own personal collection that I bought for my own reasons. And nowadays, I'm trying to be very selective about the knives that I do add to my collection because, well, let's face it, I don't have the budget that I used to. I'm a uh, poor knife maker now. And my tastes have evolved over the years, which may actually surprise a lot of you that I'm sitting out here with such a massive overbuilt knife because really that phase of my collecting is pretty much over for me. I'm really not into the overbuilt knives any longer, but there are some every now and then that will catch my attention and, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll get some in my hands or if I haven't gotten one in my hands, I'll talk to some friends that have them and a lot of them get eliminated from my want list because they're just, they're just overbuilt for the sake of being overbuilt and they're not particularly well made. This knife is that absolute exception. Even if you're not into overbuilt knives, I invite you to stay here with me and watch the video and, and look at the workmanship uh, that's involved here. Skyke Custom Knives is Peter Van Skyke, an absolutely amazing individual. I had a chance to meet him a few years ago for the first time at the Blade Show. And what immediately struck me was uh, he's a very, very young guy, but he's full of energy, has an, a really, really great disposition, a great attitude. Um, he doesn't seem to be, you know, jaded or beaten down by this industry yet. <laughs> Just give it some time. And he genuinely loves making and designing knives. All the knives that he makes are of his own design. And he has a thing for sharks. He loves sharks. So every design element or every overall shape that you see from him will bear some resemblance to some form of uh, shark species. So when I open this up, and you've already seen the pictures in the beginning of the video, I, I always forget that when I'm making the video. And I try to keep everything all mysterious and keep it closed, and I've forgotten you've already looked at all the pictures. But when you look at the overall shape and you're wondering why is the blade shaped the way that it is, because he's following a very specific design theme. And it's important to stick to the themes that you have in your mind, because part of that is going to help separate you from all the other knife makers out there. You know, it's like when I first started, you know, uh, by using my last name, I wanted to, to name all of my knife models after bones in the human body, not realizing there were only a few bones that it, this didn't sound really stupid and really silly or hard to pronounce, and I've already run out of those bone names. But it's important to stick with some sort of theme, whether it be the naming of your knives, the overall style of your knives, or a certain signature type of grind or millwork or something that you do. It's important to have that to separate you from the crowd. Now let's talk about the specs on this knife before we get into anything else and get into why I love this. Now first off, you have a four inch blade. It is massive. It's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a ton of weight on there. The overall length is nine and a half inches. This is not a tiny knife. The blade steel being used is CPM 20 CV. Not a joy to grind, but it's going to give you a good long service life, good edge retention, uh, and you're going to get good uh, corrosion resistance as well. 20 CV is a fantastic steel. It's also, unfortunately, not inexpensive, so you're going to spend a little bit of money. The name of this model, technically, as you saw in the title, is the RS 2.5 SO. What, what does all that mean? If you go back a few years in my channel, you will see Pete's first knife design that I got one of the early pieces of called the Rogue Shark. 
this is an evolution of that model. So the RS stands for Rogue Shark. 2.5, uh, obviously, it's, it's uh, two and a half generations in, uh, into this evolution. And SO sp uh, stands for Special Operator. The way that he's designed this knife was to be more of a truly tactical style. It's also made for guys that are wearing gloves as well. You'll notice all the cutouts are oversized. The thumb depression and thumb ramp are oversized. Everything on this is made where it's still going to fit your hand barehanded just fine as you see here. It's actually a very, very comfortable knife. We'll get into that in a moment. But if you were wearing gloves, if you were a true operator, you would have that extra room and not feel like you're being pushed or squeezed out of something. So the way that he's designed that really is uh, pretty damn cool. It's a tool. It is a big tool. It is, this is not a delicate gentleman's knife. It's not meant to be. As a matter of fact, Pete doesn't make anything like that. Although I would like to see what he's capable of over the next few years. I'd love to see him do a more modest sized, slimmer, smaller knife. And, and do all of his amazing uh, milling and finish work on those. Now, why is it that I love this knife as much as I do? Hopefully you can tell from my enthusiasm that I really, really do. The main thing here is, again, putting aside the fact that it's oversized, that it's uh, a quarter inch of 20 CV. Actually, I think it may be even a little bit more. It, yeah, it's a monster, but I want you to take a good look at the finish work that he's done and the machining that he's done everything is perfectly clean and what will happen when you look at a lot of makers knives that rely heavily on decorative machining they're not always going to be skilled knife makers and they're not always going to be detail oriented in their finishing if you look throughout this entire knife, and I invite you to pause this video at random times and take a good look, you'll see that everything is perfectly finished. There are no harsh edges anywhere except for obviously the cutting edge. There are no tool marks. You look all throughout this entire knife, inside and out, and it's completely devoid of tool marks. This is very, very cleanly made. Another thing that I love, I can't get my finger in there, is the fact that his SCK logo is actually completely cut out on the presentation side of the uh, titanium. Really cool, instead of just deep engraving or deep milling, uh, punched it all the way through, it's super, super cool. You would think and, and typically, given experiences you've had historically with other overbuilt knife companies, you would think that this thing would be filled with hot spots because everything is very, uh, very squared off. Even though everything is squared off, everything is, I don't know if it's really going to translate well, but let's take a look right here. This is a great example. The radius that he's done here. It still looks like a sharp defined edge, which goes along with the whole theme of the knife but it's actually rounded off so that it's comfortable in your hands. Now you pick up any number of makers that do overbuilt knives. You pick up their knives and it's a flat sap slab of titanium and if anything, if they've done anything, they've maybe chamfered the edges, which still leaves two corners. This is all soft and radius. The only area where it's not is right back here and that really flows into the, the design of the backspacer I think that's more of a design choice than anything else but it's actually very soft in the hands for the style of knife that it is even with the pocket clip I'm not a fan of very large pocket clips however had he gone shorter and stopped it right about here you would have had a hot spot a hot spot right in the meat of your hand Instead, it extends so far that it goes all the way up into your palm, and you barely notice it. Look where it's sitting. Instead of being down here, where you're likely to be pushing in really hard and feel the corners of that clip, it's actually really, really comfortable. 
The ergonomics on this for an overbuilt knife are phenomenal. Even for a standard built knife, they're very, very, very good. One of the, the big deals for me was to watch, and I, I mentioned this in that original Rogue Shark video. I said, you know, this is a good knife. It's obviously a, a junior knife maker's effort at that time. And I said, I'm really excited to see how he evolves and how he grows as a maker in the future and see where he goes with it. And every little, little tiny little niggle that I had with the original Rogue Shark was eliminated with this model. His action is fantastic, yet it still feels super solid. It, it's almost like holding a fixed blade knife in my hand. Yes, you'll, you can never make a folding knife as strong as a fixed blade. That's just the way that it is. It still folds, it has a pivot, and it has a lock, and one of those two things can possibly fail. So no, you're not going to bury this into a tree and stand on it. Well, you probably could, but you're not going to abuse it quite as much as a fixed blade. But this feels about as solid as a fixed blade. It's about as solid as any folding knife probably could be. The action is fast, the action is smooth once you get past the detent. There's no, if you remember going back to the Rogue Shark video, that was on washers, this is now on bearings, and you have the option, if you prefer washers, he will build you a knife with washers. That's not a problem at all. He has a huge options list on his website. But, this action is strikingly different than the original Rogue Shark. There are so many makers nowadays that experience early success that they don't feel the need to evolve. And you know who they are. You can look through their Instagram or their Facebook or wherever, and you can see them making the same mistakes they made two, three, four, five years ago. You see them still doing the same things they did back then. Instead of learning more and growing they stay the same because they've enjoyed uh, some sort of moderate success. They figure if it ain't broke, don't fix it. People are happy with what I'm making now. And you cannot do that. And that goes for anything. If you're an artist of any sort, you can never be happy with where you're at. You can only look forward. You're only as good as, as your last knife. Everyone needs to be better and better and better. And what he's done here is he's grown tremendously. There are no flaws in the finishing. Look how clean and smooth his grinds are and his finish work over atop that. Look how clean the titanium is. How precise the milling is. It's got a great eye for design. Again, it's meant to look like a more industrial type of tool, more so than an artistic style of knife. And he blends all of this perfectly. This is what he calls the daydream grind. It's one of the several options that he has. I chose the daydream grind because I love compound grinds, but I also appreciate a compound grind that's done right. A lot of times what you'll see, see how much thinner this grind is than this one, okay? A lot of times we see that in the opposite. We see that back here and this grind up here. What happens is it creates a speed bump. As you're trying to cut through something, that line right in between will actually catch on things. What he's done is done it in the opposite way. The blade gets thinner as you go down the blade. This is how you're supposed to do a compound grind. This is the right way to do it. You're only really making compound grinds because they look cool. It shows off your technical proficiency, your knife making prowess. It serves no actual real purpose. And in many cases, it will hinder the actual cutting ability of that knife. This, you don't have to worry about that. His grind work is beautiful. He's doing fantastic grinds. Now, when you take a look at the packaging, this is what you're going to be getting. This is the uh, the Velcro case. He has the removable uh, patch for those of you that love patches. When you get it open, your information is right here. The model name, RS 2.5 SO. The grind style that you have chosen, which I chose the Daydream. Your steel, which is 20 CV. 
the date of build. Yes, I realize how long it's been that, that I've had this and I've not made the video and I apologize. And then his signature there. Along with being able to choose your grind style, you get to choose if you want a thumb stud or if you want a uh, thumb opening hole. Now, I think they look great both ways. I really wanted to have the thumb stud. Not really sure why, but I just did. I think probably because it, it reminds me more of my original Rogue Shark. Is it a practical knife? No, there's, there's, there is nothing practical about a knife this big and this thick. Does it have a use? Absolutely. But it's not practical in the sense of an everyday carry knife. It weighs a lot. I, I, I'm not a Coke dealer, so I don't have a scale in my home. I don't constantly feel the need to weigh things, uh, but it is quite hefty. I'd probably say this is close to a half a pound if I had to guess. Probably somewhere between uh, seven and eight ounces. So it's, it's, it's a lot of titanium. It's a lot of steel. So it's probably not going to be your choice for everyday carry. However, the days that you do choose to carry it, or if you are an overbuilt guy, you only own like Medfords and Dyer Wares and um, you know things like that, then you're used to carrying larger knives, then you're really going to enjoy this. Yeah, it takes up a lot of room in the pocket. It's big and it's heavy. But when you whip this son of a bitch out, jaws drop from the really awesome look of the machining to I love the shape of this particular blade style to the grind work the finish work everything that's been undone on it is just fantastic it's impossible to hold this knife and not be impressed so if I sound like I'm overly gushing here I want you to realize it's because I really love everything about it and you can be the judge for yourself. I'm giving you super tight close-up shots in full HD. And I challenge you to find anything about this knife that isn't well executed. Now, whether the design strikes your fancy, that's a purely personal choice. Whether you like the grinds or you like the edge or whatever, that doesn't matter. That's personal opinion. I'm challenging you to find anything about this knife that is not well executed, beautifully finished, and exhibiting the hallmarks of a quality custom knife maker. Because let's face it, when you're spending $1,000 on a knife, you don't want to pick it apart the second you get it. You don't want to find glaring errors and, and tool marks all over the place and, and, you know, little burrs and stuff like that. You don't want to find that. You don't want to hold the knife and feel hot spots because the knife maker didn't know how to round off all of the edges that are coming in contact with your hand. Pete has thought of it all and he's thrown it all into this one knife. You almost feel like you could go to war with this thing, like you could cut through a damn truck. It gives you that confidence. You feel that confidence the whole day as you're carrying this thing. You, you are reminded that you're carrying this knife in your pocket. I love it. I absolutely love it. Now, is this going to be uh, the best thing to choose for slicing tomatoes or doing very fine cutting tasks? No, it's very, very thick behind the edge. It's supposed to be. It's made for you to beat the ever-loving shit out of. If you have to hack and chop at something, you don't have a weak support behind a fine edge. You have a thick edge that may not be good for the super fine slicing, although it slices just fine. Um, it's not made for that. You have other knives made for that. Break out your Sebenza. That's going to be a great slicer. This is not meant to be competition for that style of knife. So yes, does it have a very fat edge? A very steep uh, angle on that final edge? Absolutely. It's a fully supported edge. It's not going to give up on you when you're doing hard work. How many times have you just even gone down to uh, cut down a cardboard box? Didn't realize they had one of those, you know, thick, massive uh, metal staples in there. And boom, what happened? You bent, nicked, chipped, rolled your edge. Because you're using a very fine edge slicing EDC knife to do that test. Because, well, it, it should have been fine for cutting cardboard. But oops, didn't know I was going to hit that staple. 
This is the kind of knife you don't have to worry about that with. It's got a good tough steel that's made to be used in that manner and with that thick edge and that support behind it I can be beating on this thing and not have to worry about it. Now am I going to? No! It, this is... <sighs> There's something about knives of this caliber, of this level, and of course of this price, that you go, I just enjoy having it. For whatever your purpose is for use, whether it's staring at it in a glass case, or carrying it in your pocket every day, or actually using it, you enjoy it for what you want to enjoy it for. For me, it's a little bit of everything. I have certain knives that I just like to look at, that I really don't do much with. I have some that see hard use that I use all the time and I have some that kind of fall in between that I carry all the time if there's something that throughout the day I need to cut I don't have an issue pulling out a multi thousand dollar knife out of my pocket and doing it am I going to abuse it am I going to use it as a pry bar and, and pry open paint cans and stuff no this is the level of knife if you have that expendable income where you don't mind just tearing up a thousand dollar knife that if you wanted to pry open a paint can, well, yeah, you could do it. It's made to be tough. But for me, this is just a badass everyday pocket knife. Well, okay, let's take everyday out of that. We've already discussed that. But it's a great knife that I can carry the days that I feel like I want to carry it. You know, it's just like, you know, we're, a lot of us are gun guys as well. We all have that one gun that we absolutely love. For, for me, one, one of my favorite guns uh, is my Sig Sauer P229 Legion. Love it. It's amazing. Shoots unbelievably well. It's accurate. It's beautiful. It fits in my hand great. Everything about it is awesome, but there are just some days it's just too big and heavy to lug around. So I'll reach for you know something small like the like Glock 43 or something that's much lighter and easier to carry. That doesn't mean I don't appreciate and want to specifically carry that SIG on certain days. And that's exactly where a knife like this fits in. You may not reach for it every single day. You may not reach for it five out of seven days out of the week. But there are going to be times that you're going to pick this up and go, damn, I, r I really want to carry this today. I really want to show my buddy we're going out, we're going to compare our cool new knives. Uh, or I'm going out in the woods and I want to have something that's a little bit tougher. I want to be able to, to cut into some wood or some shit and, you know, whittle down some stakes or something for the tent. I don't, I don't know what the hell you're doing out there. I'm not a camper. I'm not an outdoorsy person. Um, maybe you want to kill a friggin' bear. I don't know. But there is going to be a day that you're going to pick this up and you're going to gawk it and you're going to fondle it. And you're going to go, I have to carry this today. And you're going to be so happy the whole day that you're carrying it. And you're going to play with it. And that's one of the things that I'm so thankful for. That Pete has really, really worked so hard on his actions. Because I love the original Rogue Shark. It was cool. It was absolutely different than everybody else's knives. But it just didn't quite have that action where I would pick it up. And I go, oh, I want to carry this today. And then I would go like this. And it would open about that much. And I would go, ah. Oh, yeah, I know. I can flick my wrist a little bit. And it opens just fine. It was, it was a great knife. But there were just days that I went, well, oh, I'll just carry something different today. And with this one, every time I touch it, every little thing that I want in a knife that day, it satisfies. So let's get one last final close-up look at the entire knife, look at the skill of his grinding, the cleanliness of his finish work, and recognize the skill that he has taught himself over this time, and how much he has evolved. And that's what I truly appreciate is, you know, there were, there were little critiques I had on the original Rogue Shark. And I talked to him about those uh, personally as well. And he took a lot of that stuff into account in his future designs. And another thing that I respect is that he stops and he looks for himself at his knives and goes, I'm happy with where I am, but I want to be just a little bit better. I want to change this. I want to do this. I want to work harder on that. And all of that is evident in the finish work and all of the detailing of this knife. Now, I'm not saying what he's doing is, 
impossible and that no other knife maker is doing it but it is separating him from the lower end of the pack where a lot of the overbuilt knife makers kind of dwell he is raising himself up into the status of a much higher end knife maker because he's not just letting anything out the door this is a knife that I guarantee you when he was building his initial prototypes this is number zero this is the very first one that he has let out of his shop but I'm sure he went through a lot of prototypes and I guarantee you they did not have this radius edge and I guarantee you that he held this knife and he squeezed it and he cut stuff with it and he felt it trying to torque in his hand and he went ah oh, man that's a sharp edge I gotta get rid of that and the result is a massively overbuilt knife that you would think at first glance is cartoonish and ridiculous and has no practical place in your collection to something that is now comfortable and usable and that in my opinion changes the game that in my opinion sets him apart from many many of the knife makers today that are making overbuilt knives and I think it was important to bring this out here and show it to you that's why I did not rush doing this video I wanted to spend time and, and really speak about how I feel this knife was made and why I feel that even though I personally really don't do the overbuilt knife thing anymore I, I, I wanted to share with everybody why this is in my collection and why you have seen me carrying it taking pictures on Instagram having it in my pocket and enjoying it as much as I do because well it's just really damn well made now the one thing on this knife that I do want to point out uh, because Pete actually sent me a text message about two or three weeks after I got this he says dude send me your knife back I'm like why well, what's going on I'm like I'm carrying the damn thing I'm not sending it back to you what's the matter he goes well I just realized that uh, the pocket clip has some harsh edges on it that don't match up with the rest of the frame and it's not as comfortable as it can be this is the stuff that he's going through mentally all the time he's always trying to find an issue to take care of it I said well for me it's not an issue but every SO I believe after number one or number two um, and he may have actually taken those back and fixed that as well he has radius the pocket clip as well so that it's more comfortable and there's no sharp edges um, I haven't had any issues with it. it it's not a thing for me so I'm gonna keep mine just the way that it is uh, however uh, if anybody was watching the video going why didn't Jim point that out I'm looking at the close-ups and that looks like a really harsh edge it is uh, and it is something that he has identified himself and is already taken care of I didn't want to make a big deal out of it because I don't want to scare anybody but uh, that is an issue that if you were having one built right now it's already taken care of you don't even have to worry about it so again uh, go over to his website he has a wonderful and detailed description of who he is and what his uh, mentality is in this crazy world and you can see all the options that are out there for all of the knives that he makes whether you want a thumb stud you want a hole if you want bearings if you want washers if you want to do the daydream grind or the other grinds and uh, listen here's the really fun part if you're gonna order one just say makers choice do whatever the hell you want to do and I promise you Pete will be standing there with your blade in his hand at the grinder going what kind of crazy shit can I come up with today I have seen some insane grinds coming out of his shop and while this one ab is absolutely fantastic he has done much wilder grinds than this so if you're feeling I don't know feeling lucky just say uh, makers choice do something crazy with it I don't care what you do I promise you he's gonna cope with something way better than is whatever is floating around in your head uh, he is offer also offering these in DLC coating for the frames and or the blade so you can mix and match or you can do the whole thing in black DLC and he is one of the handful of knife makers out there that is using true real DLC from Ion Bond real DLC not that bullshit coating that you're seeing uh, so many other companies and makers where they're calling it DLC but true real DLC it's expensive as hell 
but it's absolutely worth it. It's a very strong finish that will hold up well over time. Anyway, I've gone on long enough. This is running into about 30 minutes. I do want to stop here, um, but I just want to say if, if you've ever wondered what the allure is to an overbuilt knife, and you're kind of afraid to order one from somewhere and get it and go, yeah, it's kind of what I thought. It's just a big cinder block in my hands and it's not all that great. Go Skike. Try a Skike. And I promise you, once you've put it in your hand, you're going to be very, very, very impressed. All right, guys, I'm out of here for now. And I will try to catch up with you very soon on another new video.